Each step I take, my Savior goes before me. And with his loving hands, he leads the way. And with each breath, I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, I know that he will guide me. To higher ground, he ever leads me on. Until someday, the last step will be taken. Each step I take, just leads me closer home. At times I feel, my faith begin to waver. When up ahead I see a chasm wide. It's then I turn and look up to my Savior. I am strong when He is by my side. Each step I take, I know that He will guide me. To higher ground, He ever leads me on. Until someday the last step will be taken, each step I take just leads me closer home. I trust in God no matter come what may, for life eternal is in His hand. He holds the key that opens up the way that will lead me to the promised land. Each step I take, I know that He will guide me to higher ground. He ever leads me on until someday the last step will be taken. Each step I take just leads me closer home. I want to talk to you tonight about living happily in a world of fear. The first letter of Peter was written to Christians who'd heard of an approaching persecution. It had already begun in Rome, and rumor had it that it was spreading to the provinces of the empire. And so Peter wrote that letter to encourage them and to comfort them. Now, he didn't tell them that the rumors were unfounded or that they were in no danger of suffering, but instead he told them how to react when the trouble came. And by the way, sometimes preachers give the impression that if people turn to Christ, it will mean the end of all their difficulties in life and they won't have any problems like other people. Well, Peter wouldn't have preached that kind of sermon. Nor would Paul, for that matter. Uh, Paul, remember, was the man concerning whom the Lord said to Ananias, Go and tell him how great things he must suffer for my sake. And Peter says, If you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. However, although it's plain that Christians may have to suffer for what they believe, Peter says that suffering cannot really harm the Christian. He says, who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? First Peter 1, verse 13. Now, that may seem to be something of a contradiction, but the fact is that people may hurt your body, but they cannot harm you. You are not a body. You're living in a body for a short time, and sooner or later you're going to leave it. You'll be out of it. You'll be with Christ, which is far better if you're a Christian. And at the resurrection, you will receive a body like his most glorious body, better than anything you ever imagined. Who is he that will harm you? They may hurt your possessions or your property, but they can't harm you. They can't damage what you are. And if you have to suffer because you're a Christian, says Peter, happy are ye. In other words, there's a blessing in it. There's no need to be long-faced and go about saying, oh, see what I'm going through because I'm a Christian. Peter says, fear not their fear, neither be troubled. And I want to seize on that sentence this evening, fear not their fear. What Peter means is, don't be afraid of the things that they are afraid of. Now, what are the things of which men and women are afraid? 
Well, what about fear of the past? How many people are there running away from their past? People with a guilty conscience. Wasn't it Shakespeare who said, Conscience doth make cowards of us all? You see, conscience not only tells you that you've done wrong, it has the irritating habit of telling you that you're going to get caught. And fear often has its root in a bad conscience like this. And when a bad conscience runs riot, it's a terrifying thing. There's the story of the Greek who pulled down the nest of the birds around his house because, he said, the birds were constantly accusing him of murdering his father. Well, those singing birds were innocent. They knew nothing about him or his father. But his bad conscience was eating away his soul all the time. He was a guilty man. And what about some New Testament examples of this? What about Felix, the Roman governor to whom Paul spoke? We read that Paul reasoned concerning righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. And Felix was terrified. Why was he terrified? Because he was an immoral man and he had a bad conscience. And what about Judas, the betrayer? There's a painting of Judas showing him wandering about in the darkness, the night of the betrayal. He comes to a fire where some Roman soldiers are warming themselves, and the light of the fire catches his face, and it's a haunted face. He's regretting what he's done, and yet Judas staggers off into the night, clutching the bag of silver to himself. A guilty man. And you know the story of Judas. You know what happened to him, what he did. He committed suicide. Now, the wonderful thing is that when people have a guilty conscience, Jesus Christ offers forgiveness. It is possible. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, Peter speaks of an appeal to God for a clean conscience. He says, As in the days of Noah, eight souls were saved by water, so now also even baptism doth now also save us. Not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but an appeal to God for a clean conscience, a conscience right with God. We can have a conscience right with God if we come to God through Jesus Christ, because there's forgiveness for every possible sin. No matter what a man has done in the past, no matter what he is, there is no man who has sunk so low that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot reach him. And no man who has gone beyond the reach of the grace of God. So some people fear the past, but other people fear the present. Right now there are people who fear all kinds of things. Some fear sickness and disease. Others have an obsession about their health. Others fear growing old and wonder what they're going to do when they retire. Others have fears about their future in the sense that they're concerned about their job and their profession. Others fear for their children growing up in a world like ours today. Some fear loneliness. Quite recently, I read about a man who killed his two little daughters, no more than ten years old, and then took his own life because he feared for their future. And how often have you read of someone committing suicide because he thought he had a certain terminal ailment, a terrible disease? There are some people who, putting it bluntly, are hypochondriacs. They have an obsession about sickness today. And the most frequently consulted book in the house is the doctor's book, the medical dictionary. And I might tell you that a medical dictionary can be one of the worst books you can buy. Because you start going through it, you read about ailments and the symptoms, and before long you convince yourself you have every single one of them. Why? You can discover from reading a medical book that you have a complaint you never knew existed before. I'm sure that I've been much healthier since I gave my medical book away. But to be serious, this is the fear of many people, the obsession with ailments and doctors and cures and medicines. You think of Howard Hughes, the multimillionaire who died recently. Now, Mr. Hughes's fear of infection and contamination became proverbial. You must have heard of the length to which he went to live in the sterilized atmosphere in infection-free air with everything disinfected. Of course, it didn't do him any good because he died like everyone else dies. And I suppose in a way that what he lived in the later years of his life was a kind of living death, so that he took longer over dying than most people do. Now this fear of sickness is very real with people. Go to the doctor's waiting room and look at their faces. 
go to the hospital and see people awaiting tests and examinations to determine whether or not they have diseases. How many are there who fear terminal ailments? They think they have a complaint that's going to carry them off. And they're afraid. Because for them, it would be the end of everything. The end of their hope, the end of their happiness, the end of their life. Everything would collapse. And the Christian? Well, of course, the Christian doesn't enjoy sickness and he doesn't seek pain. He's no masochist. I'm allergic to pain. I don't care to be sick. I don't like to be unwell. But I'm not afraid of it. I don't like it because it prevents me from doing the things that I know I should be doing. And I certainly don't believe that sickness is all bad or that it's the end of everything. And as for dying, how many fear death? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 15 speaks of people who through fear of death all their lifetime are subject to bondage. Now is that true? Are people afraid of dying? And is it a kind of bondage? You know that it is. I once read about a certain king who gave the command that the word death should never be spoken in his presence. And another rule he said is that if ever he looked pale, nobody should ever remark on it. He was afraid of dying. And there are people who are afraid of dying. And you know why? It's because they're afraid of the future. Death seems to be so dark and so mysterious to them. They don't know what's beyond it. For that matter, there are some people who fear the end of the world right now. How long is the world going to last? We don't know. I don't know. You don't know. And the people who claim to know don't know either. But they don't know that they don't know. They think they do. But many people are scared. They are afraid that the end of the world may not be too far away. And they keep peeping around corners looking for the signs of the times, as they call them. And their heart misses a beat every time someone comes along and sets a date for the end of the world. Of course, if I were not a Christian, I suppose that I too might not really see thought of the end of the world and the subsequent judgment. But surely, the intelligent common sense thing to do is not to go around in a constant dread, waiting for something terrible to happen, you don't know when, but to be ready, so that no matter when it does happen, you won't be caught unprepared. Christians do not fear their fear. A Christian doesn't fear death or the end of the world, because he knows that either will bring him closer to his Savior. The Christian fear in this matter is different, for he has a fear of his own, and that's the fear of failing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, failing to tell people that Jesus Christ saves, and failing to match up his faith with a solid Christian life, the life of one who is looking for and waiting for the coming of Christ. Now, what is your fear tonight? What are you afraid of? The gospel of Jesus Christ says you can be freed from a guilty conscience. You can be freed from the fear of living, freed from the fear of dying, freed from the fear of the future. All of these fears can be taken care of. Jesus says in John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Now it's faith that gives the victory, you see. The love of Jesus Christ in the hearts of men and women destroys all kinds of fear. The Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, Perfect love casts out fear. And that's true. There's no fear in love. And once you recognize that God loves you and that God is concerned about you, that Jesus Christ died for you, you recognize that with God in control, the God who loves you in control, there is nothing at all in the whole of the universe concerning which you ought to be afraid. I say again, it's faith that gives the victory. Somebody said, fear knocked at the door. Faith opened it. There was no one there. Fear can spring from doubt and uncertainty. Faith, on the other hand, gives assurance and courage. I like the passage, Romans 8, verse 15, where Paul says that we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In other words, we're able to look at God and call God our Father, 
and that fact dispels all fear in our hearts. But what about the fears of the Christian? Well, you say, well, Christians shouldn't be afraid of anything. Well, certainly he doesn't fear judgment because Romans 8 verse 1 says there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And Paul says that the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. And the Christian certainly doesn't fear death because 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 says that Jesus Christ has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And he doesn't fear the end of the world either because Christ will come to be glorified in all those who believe on that day. And the Christian is waiting for that day. Nevertheless, there are some things that a Christian ought to be afraid of. First Peter chapter 3 verse 15 tells us that a Christian ought to be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks the reason of the hope that's within him with meekness and fear. That simply means that a Christian ought to be afraid of misrepresenting his Savior and misrepresenting his faith either by the things he says or the things he does. And again, I think a Christian ought to be afraid of losing contact with Jesus. Now how can you avoid losing contact with the Savior? Well, Peter tells you that too in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. He says, you should sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Now, what does sanctify mean? Well, it means to set apart. And how do you sanctify Christ as Lord? It simply means that you set Christ apart on a solitary throne. You allow Christ to be the sole ruler in your life. You give him no rival. Because if Jesus Christ is not Lord over all, he isn't Lord at all. And Jesus Christ has to have the first place in your life. But once he has that place, then he's able to say to you, as he said to men in olden times, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And it's on this note that I want to finish tonight. We are living in troubled days, days when the hearts of men and women are failing them for fear because they just do not know what the future holds in store for them. But I want to tell you that all the conviction, all the assurance, the certainty in my being, that it's possible even today for you to have a peace that passes all understanding, for every fear in your life to be dispelled, whether it's the fear of sickness or disease or death, whether it's the fear of growing old, the fear of loneliness, whether it's guilt in your life, whatever it is, that fear can be dispelled by the one who came to speak peace to your soul, by the one who came to bring that peace of God from the God of peace. There's a hymn that Christians like to sing. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And that's wonderfully true for the Christian. Now, if there's anything that I've said tonight concerning which you want to write to me, then please do so, care of this station. I'll be glad to hear of any question you have, any problem you have, and I'd be very happy to help in any possible way that I can. Please use me. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me summer springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their course.
forces above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well. Soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sighed. 
The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul.